Welcome back to The Lincoln Project. I'm your host, Reed Yale. Today, I'm once again joined by Dan Barkoff, a former Navy SEAL and founder of Veterans for Responsible Leadership, a veteran-run super PAC that supports local, state, and federal candidates committed to principled leadership. He is a graduate of the United States Naval Academy and Harvard Medical School and is now an associate professor and emergency medicine doctor at the University of Vermont, so I already don't feel very good about myself. Dan, welcome back. Reed, so happy to be here, man. We'll have some fun today. Well, all right. Well, Dan, I don't, you know, we got a lot of places we can start. So let me start um, a little bit macro and then we can go micro. So um, as we see the things that have unfolded in the last three plus weeks or so in Israel and in Gaza, explain what it means to have um, the president and the National Command Authority send not one aircraft carrier battle group or strike group to the eastern Mediterranean, but two. What does that mean when when an opponent sees that much metal coming across the ocean at them? What does that mean to an opponent? Yeah, it's a good it's a good point. I mean, the deterrence value is is pretty critical in the, in a situation like this. I mean, you've got a whole bunch of regional actors that uh, you know would threaten to get involved uh, one way or another, whether that's Iran through proxy groups like Hezbollah or Hamas obviously is is already in the thick of it. But, um, you know, you've also got other potential regional actors like even something like Syria, um, you know, or uh, the the Lebanese government, which would allow, you know, militias to kind of, uh, you know, step up their attacks against against Israel, northern Israel. And I think similar to commanders throughout history. Um, you know, for the Israelis in such a small space, you know, once you open a second front uh, in a place like that, it, it becomes that much more difficult. Um, they have the advantage, you know, there's, there's some advantages that Israel has in a situation like that. The biggest one being what we would call like interior lines where, um, you know, it, it would take groups trying to move around Israel and attack Israel from different angles uh, longer to, to get to places and things like that. So there's some inherent advantages to being on the defense. But having two American carrier battle groups, I mean, that's an awesome amount of firepower. Um, I wish I knew off the top of my head how many we had, um, you know, flying sorties uh, into and in, in out of Iraq in, in OIF-1. But um Two carrier groups uh, sends a pretty strong message that um, don't 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 try to play to anyone else, right? Because it's not just the air wings, right? Uh, which are the F 18s the uh, the E two Hawkeyes or sort of command and control, uh, but also the the cruisers, the destroyers. I assume there's some submarines in the area, right? Like there's a lot of capability having you know several you know ten or twelve thousand sailors and all the stuff they bring with them. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's that region of the world. We've been active in it so long militarily. I mean, you know, there's also air bases in other places. But yeah, the, the you know, you have uh, the ability to send T-LAMs off of ships. Um, you've got cruisers. You've got Aegis, cra- Aegis class, uh, you know, cruisers. Um, you have destroyers, all the accessories. It's a carrier battle group. It's not just an individual aircraft carrier that's trucking around with an air wing. That's a, a great point. Well, and we've also seen, I think it might have been a cruiser in the, I think either in the Persian Gulf or in the Red Sea that actually shot down some rockets that had been, I think, maybe shot out of Yemen towards right. Israel. Yep. Yeah. So I think, I mean, when I think about, um, you know, the complexity of this situation and all the various things that Biden's trying to balance right now, it really is, you know, a, a like an Olympic diver, high degree of difficulty, right? You've got a conflict between um, a historic ally in Israel, albeit one that's an imperfect ally, but uh, we, you know, which we have both a moral and, and legal obligation to defend. You've got a civilian population and a, a terrorist organization that's infiltrated and in, in kind of within this civilian population. Um, you've got other regional actors that want to turn the situation to their advantage, either by, uh, you know, intervening directly or sending weapons or support or, or things like that. And then you have to combine that with the international community and various, uh, various malign forces like, you know, what is Russia doing? What is China doing? Um, you know, the, the Chinese or sorry, the, the Russians rather have met relatively recently with the Iranian leadership. 
So it's it's a really uh, you know quite a tinderbox, and I do think this is one of those situations where experience matters. We're not doing something rash matters. We're trying as best possible to minimize the number of people actively playing in this shooting war is uh, a goal that benefits the entire world. So, you know, I, I hesitate to think what, um, you know, Mr. Trump would do in a similar situation. But, uh, you know, I really think that this is a situation where nuance and wisdom um, and, and having a measured response you can be firm and be measured at the same time. And, you know, it's a time that I'm thankful for Biden's leadership. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I was I was talking to a, 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 a an ally of 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 ours uh, yesterday and I said, you know, I got to be honest with you. If I were the president of the United States and I looked around domestically and uh, I saw what was going on, I, I, I'd be rip shit with my friends. Yeah. Here I am single handedly trying to keep the Western world held together. The Western Alliance put together the Israelis, um, not only sovereign as a nation, but also uh, restrained, to your point, to the extent you can restrain the Israelis in this particular case, while trying to keep at arm's length, you know, the Iranians and the Saudis who had their own little Molotov Ribbentrop conversation a few weeks ago at, you know, at the urging of the Russians and everything else and all of this stuff interconnected. I'd be like, can you all please go out there and defend me? Because right. I'm trying to do my freaking job, right? This is this is really difficult stuff, right? You know, I uh, I've got a brother who works for the State Department, and it, it's busy times over there. You know, people are the American government is hustling right now to try to keep the lid on this thing, and you know, the, we should be thankful for that. Um, you know, this is a time where uh, statesmanship as it's classically understood, is, is critically important. You know, we've, we've had things like this with, you know, shuttle, shuttle diplomacy, right? And so, um, you know, getting Blinken over there and, and meeting with people. Well, and the president himself? The Ab- absolutely. And, you know, absolutely. And, you know, the downstream effects from, from this for our, our allied struggle in Ukraine, um, there's a lot going on. It is an incredibly complex time internationally for... Uh, for this country. And and I would say this, and I'm going to say this at the expense of sounding both conspiratorial and alarmist, Dan, but so many of the non, both non-state actors, but also state, state-led state bad actors, right, are all in cahoots with one another because the one thing they don't like of all of it is that the United States, I think a lot, much of it due to the fact that Joe Biden is president of the United States, has retaken its place as the leader of the free world. And boy, they sure don't like it. Yeah, I mean, we're the, you know, we're the, to borrow an FDR phrase, right? Like we're the arsenal of democracy right now. And we're, we're, we've, we've not risked, you know, the, the single American soldier uh, in either of these conflicts thus far, um, you know, we haven't lost anyone, though I'm sure there's covert things going on. And, um, you know, we're we're doing this well, both Ukraine, you know, the, the Russian was supposed to cruise in there and, you know, it was going to be a, a three day long conflict and Zelensky was going to be assassinated. And, you know, that did not come to pass and it did not come to pass because, you know, Biden was on top of it. And, you know, Israel, same thing, right? I mean, this came out of kind of nowhere. There, there's this whole, um, you know, no one saw this coming or, or if people saw it coming, it didn't get up to decision makers. But um, I, I think since that this October 7th uh, attack on Israel happened, um, I think the U.S. has done a remarkable job in, in preventing it from from going further than it should. No, well, I think that's right. I mean, to your point, it would have been. It, w- it would be a very different thing. I mean, I don't know if it was a week, 10 days, two weeks, but the president of the United States flew into an active conflict zone for the second time in a year, right, almost immediately in the context of this, right, which hopefully will go on very, you know, is with as few more casualties and it time wise, you know, is it, it will be as short as possible. But like he didn't waste any time. He said, gas up the jet. Let's go. And there were critical things, I think, that had to be conveyed, you know, kind of in that short, in that immediate time frame, right? Um, you know, there was there was a pause, uh, whether it was a tactical pause, but there was there was a pause. There were hostages released. Um, there was an air campaign, ongoing air campaign being launched by Israel. Um, 
their, you know, a blind rage, let's go right now kind of response. I'm sure there are people arguing for that in, you know, Netanyahu's ear, right? So um, it has to be measured. Um, you know, the response, Hamas needs to be wiped off the earth. And we also have to try to ensure that our ally minimizes civilian casualties. And these are really tough goals to to get together. Let me ask you this, just on the on the mili- American military, and then I want to get to Hamas and some other things because I think there was some there was there was a note that um, maybe some members of the Delta Force, which is uh, Army Special Operations, right? I think hostage rescue is is one of their specialities, and I think uh, SEAL Team Six, I think, had also some elements of them had been deployed uh, to Europe as well. Is that the sa- Is that the sort of you know, tip of the spear type thing, like sending an aircraft carrier, which is we don't know if we'll need these guys, but if we do, we want to make sure that they're within arm's reach if we got to deploy them. Yeah, those the to tier the extent one that units, you can tell us. Yeah, yeah, obviously. sure. I mean, I wasn't part of a you know a tier one unit, quote unquote. Um, I was I was on the vanilla side of the SEAL teams, and you know it was great. <laughs> is but is the, that really um, a thing? I mean, oh, yeah, Dan, is that really a there's thing? There's vanilla, and then there's black, right? And so <laughs> okay. you know, so. Um, but yeah, the tier one units have multiple missions, right? But the, you know, they're strategic missions of national import. If they, and I've not heard that, but if they're you know forward deployed, it's because they're they're being ready for you know the potential hostage rescue. Um, I I can imagine Gaza would be an incredibly difficult place to uh, you know to find a military solution to a hostage crisis. Um, there's all sorts of problems with that uh you know at a tactical level which we don't have to get into but it would be it would be again very very high degree of difficulty um you know you'd be going into uh potentially like a tunnel network and and things like this and these are it's not as simple as in a not in a non-permissive environment as we call it you know it's not the same as like a bank robber with you know hold up in the uh, you know, the Wells Fargo, it's, it's much, much harder to do something like that. Um, I think that it would be very, very difficult, not, a, not necessarily impossible. I mean, it's all circumstances can change, but it'd be very, very difficult to rescue any of these people militarily, right. unfortunately. And, and so let, let's, let's talk about that because as of this recording, um, Hamas still holds what we believe is about 200 hostages. Um, you know, I think getting them back safely is is probably a prime goal of the Israelis, uh, not only for the Israelis that are being held, but any foreign nationals that are being held. Um, Hamas doesn't appear to have any desire whatsoever to give them back anytime soon. I can not I can only imagine, Dan, that the conditions in which they're being held are awful um, and that, you know, they they are very, you know, the, the Hamas captors are probably very willing to say we might shoot you today. So just stand by. Um, but also, you know, there there have been now multiple interviews of Hamas leaders and and Dan from a from a both military and a geopolitical perspective, it looks like they're trying to goad the Israelis into more and maybe even we as America into more, which is like we want Israel wiped off the map. Just so you understand. Like we don't care if our own people die, right? We're gonna do this stuff. Why don't you think that 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 is getting more purchase here in the U S because if there's one thing we know is that, you know, we as a country have experience with, you know, Islamic terror going back, not only to nine 11, obviously, but Western Europe and other things. Why uh, the, you know, Lockerbie, um, why is it that you think that, do you think that like, as you said, Hamas is a terrorist organization. They are also a political organization that happens to, and I put this in air quotes, govern Gaza. Why, why do you think the nature of their beastliness is, is being overshadowed here? Yeah, I mean, there, you see some stuff in kind of the lay press about, you know, comparing them to ISIS, right? And it really is, there, there's a lot of differences, actually, between Hamas and, and, and ISIS, but... um. I think, you know, so what Hamas is trying to do is to get the Israelis to overstep, right? So, I mean, there's the short term October 7th plan where we're going to go in and we're going to kidnap a bunch of people and, you know, kill a bunch of people. And we're going to we're going to go back with just just straight bargaining chips, right? There's no 
there's no intelligence you're going to get from uh, somebody at a music festival, right? Totally, right? Like you're not you're not learning anything new. It's not like a classic prisoner of war where you you know you're going to try to figure out the battle plans or something like that. So, you know, you go in and and you they wanted it to be outrageous. They wanted it to be an atrocity, and and it was. And the point is to get Israel angry, right? Which is completely understandable, but then in their anger to overstep, right? And so my wars, my my generation's wars, you know, uh, there was plenty of overstep. And that whatever one thinks of how Iraq and Afghanistan worked out, um, there's a pretty solid case to be made that, uh, you know, it was, it was overstepping and our long-term interests were suffered because of sort of short-term to medium-term potential gains. And so if you can get the Israelis to take over Gaza, right, they know they're not going to stop Israeli tanks ro- rolling into Gaza. It's all about an insurgency to come, right? Like you hand Israel this sticky mess of, okay, now you've taken Gaza and now you have to, you know, govern it. And there's there's kind of some fantastical people out there who are who are arguing, oh, the UN's going to come in. I, not really, man. The UN doesn't go, I mean, if you look at UN peacekeeping interventions, they don't go to like super hot places, right? Like they go to, you know, kind of after everything's calmed down, they go to, um, you know, there's, there's a couple exceptions, but, you know, the UN goes to places like Kosovo, right? Or, you know, Rwanda after the genocide is, right, yeah. is largely is, done. Yeah, Yugoslavia where, like, yeah. yeah. And, and so, even sometimes when they're there, it's like they don't really, you know, they got blue helmets on, they got tanks, but they're not shooting any bad guys. They 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 have a mixed record. Let's leave it at that. So you know, so Israel's going to be stuck with Gaza after they take it over, right? And then you know, if you're Hamas, I, I mean, I think their calculus is great. We've got now we've got a place where we can, you know, hit them. We can we can make them extend. We can stick them with Gaza. They're in charge of governing it. And not only can we get to Israeli soldiers and and kill them. Uh, on a much more regular basis, um, you know, perhaps the perhaps the the insurgency now becomes something that's politically untenable in a place like Israel, where you know, if you remember, on October sixth, um, it was not a very unified country at the moment. You know, they've right. had a ton of domestic uh, kind of travail. All of it leading last... back to Netanyahu. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think the Hamas blueprint for blueprint for this uh, this operation thus far. It's it's an open question of who is going to win this, right? And and, and not in a tactical sense. I was going to say sense. because what's the yeah. yeah? Because I guess that's that's the that's a real that's that's a the sort of prime question. Dan is like, what's the definition of victory at this point? Right. So you know, my big battle read was was Fallujah. So I was in Fallujah in in '04 in the November part of it, right? And there are some similarities, and there's a lot of very real differences. So. You know, in Fallujah, you know, we had the city surrounded. We're going to go do all these, you know, we're going to go in. We're going to get the bad guys finally, you know. And you're telling here, people to get place. out, right? You're like, if you're you telling don't... people to get out from April to, you know, Halloween, they're like, hey, get out, get out, get out. All these civilians leave. The only people left are these hardcore fighters. We're going to go in. We're going to, you know, kick their ass. And that's that's going to be that, right? Well, the leadership had gotten out. Right. And I'm sure the Hamas leadership, for the most part, is not, you know, in some bunker with an AK and an S vest, like ready to go. You know, the Hamas leadership, the people who really matter and make decisions. I mean, they got to be out of there at this. point. Yeah, I think the one guy in an interview I saw yesterday was was being interviewed from Qatar. Right. Like, yeah, he's not even in the right. country anymore. Right. So, you know, yes, there's value in in kind of wiping out, you know, their their tactical, you know, their supply of rockets. Right. Like. You go in, you go into Gaza, you destroy all the rockets. Okay, that makes your country safer. That's a tangible net win. But, you know, are you going to get the guys who planned this? I'd be really surprised. Well, and and I think, you know, looking back on the on the wag the dog piece of this, which is Netanyahu, you know, I, I've heard from a couple of friends of mine who live in Israel one of whom is fairly well well politically connected that like when this is over damn whatever that definition is like bb's done that's I would what hope they, so. one guy said to me texted me he said when this is over bb must leave 
it won't be hundreds of thousands of Israelis in the street. It will be millions. So you have a situation now where you have a leader who was trying to maintain control, you know, prior to this through authoritarian means, right? We're, you know, because he's he's been under indictment and he's on trial again. Um, he just barely snuck back into power. Now he is politically hobbled. He's already attacked the military and the intelligence services, which can't make them particularly happy, right? And now it's a thing where Dan, if he calls everybody home and says, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna pull the tanks back. We'll do tactical strikes." But for the most part, you know, we're going to we're going to let this simmer instead of boil. He knows he's done politically. Because somebody else is going to take over. And that's now where you have, you know, this is where the you know, to, to bring it back to sort of broader pol political philosophy, where authoritarians like a Netanyahu don't have any personal desire for this to end. Unfortunately, I'm afraid. Right. I mean, there's there's clearly some, you know, some truth in that. Right. Like. Is any is any politician going to try to turn a crisis into you know to their own personal advantage? Of course, right? I mean, I do think you know my opinions are like elbows, right? Everyone's got one, but you know my my opinion is I, I don't see a way in which you you don't go into Gaza. You can't you can't let the rockets stay. You can't let the you know the people who uh, you know shot babies and and cut off people's heads with garden hose. You, you can't let them you can't let them live anymore. You, you got to go get them and. It's unfortunate, but, you know, the human nature being what it is, there are some things that only get solved when you send your young men into the mud. And this is one of those times for, for Israel. I just hope they are thinking about the long game. So in your experience on the ground in a, in a country like Iraq, um, and I know that mo most of your experience there, I assume, was was tactical if not hyper tactical in nature but you're 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 well studied enough and but well experienced enough to have an answer to these questions is like you know the southern end of gaza is egypt um the saudis got lots of money right lots of room uh the jordanians have been taken in palestinians for a long time you know what what if any responsibility does the balance of the arab world have because Here's the one thing, as you know, Dan, having gone through Iraq and potentially in and I don't know if you served in Afghanistan, too, is that once you start something like this, as Vladimir Putin is now learning, no one knows how it's going to end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you break it, you buy it. Right. So I don't know. I am certainly not an expert on you know Middle Eastern politics. I mean, but but the question is, you know, in what role if you're Saudi Arabia, right? You know, if you're MBS, like in what role are the Palestinians sort of most useful to you? Right. Uh, you know, are they and then you've I mean, there are factions within within Palestine. Right. Like, you know, the uh, the West Bank Palestinians are not run by Hamas. Right. So, you know, there's there are kind of, um, you know, sort of radical differences. Um, I think that. I mean, you certainly can can make a moral obligation for all this stuff but you know moral obligations um don't don't have a way of going very far as far as they ought to um so i i i don't know the answer to that question and and i'm not sure that anyone does right we're we're truly in kind of uncharted waters in the middle east where you know if you look back at israel's other conf israel's other conflicts you know the, the yom kippur war the the six day war right these are conflicts um, that were existential physically for the Israelis, for the, the state of Israel, right? Like, you know, the Egyptian tanks could have been rolling through Tel Aviv, right? That's, that's an end result that was possible at the time. And that's not possible here. And, and Hamas knows that, right? Like their, their strategy is different. They are not trying to, um, they're, they're playing the long game and, I I don't fully understand their calculus because I don't I don't think like them, but I, I really think the the end result that is most sort of profitable for Hamas is if Israel gets bogged down in a lengthy insurgency in Gaza. Yeah, it's just um think about like, you know, those little those little things you see on a trail or when you're walking through the woods like foxtails, right? And they get stuck more often than not like a dog's paw. And the more you pull on it, the more it sort of embeds itself into the flesh and the tissue, right? And that's sort of what Hamas has done here, which is they're the foxtail in the side of Israel, and the more that Israel sort of yanks on it, the deeper it gets. And, you know, 
to your point, to continue the the because you're a doctor, to use a, a medical analogy here, at some point you're probably going to have to use a scalpel to carve it out, right? Um, and and that's hard because. Uh, in the middle of all this are a bunch of, you know, a couple of million civilians who I don't assume want to be p any part of this. No, I think it's, you know, I, I'd have to see, I'd have to talk to an expert on Gaza about what the, you know, what the public opinion of the average Gazan, uh, you know, the, the average barber in, in Gaza, you know, what they really think of Hamas. Um, but it's, regardless, it's, it's tricky. Like every every Israeli bomb that gets dropped and accidentally, you know, kills a kid, um, that's just propaganda for Hamas, right? So it's it's not just a moral. There's a moral need to minimize casualties. I mean, there's a, there's a real strategic need to minimize casualties. Yeah. Well, and you know, the the this is where just to bring it back home, um, you know, so you see all these mostly younger. Americans, college kids, you know, protesting on behalf of of, Pal uh, of Hamas, um, you know, and and it 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 confuses me. But let's let's set that aside. And there's a couple of things that that are I'm going to use the word befuddling, Dan, because I'm not sure what the other word is, which is, you know, Hamas has made note that it has been in close contact with both the Iranians and it sent its leadership to Moscow. Right. And we have to assume that certainly the Iranians are helping financially and otherwise, and the Russians are helping financially and otherwise, because, again, it, it bogs down the United States. So now it's OK. Well, <clears throat> this is, you know, by the transitive property, if you're pro Hamas, you're pro Russia. Right. I'm, I'm going to make that assertion. Um, but then I saw the other day that that, um, you know, you know, it's like. You know, these rights equal these rights, and it was like. Palestinian or, you know, Palestinian rights or Gazan rights equal women's rights, equal choice rights, equal trans rights, equal LGBT rights. And I'm thinking to myself, like, I don't think you've even done the first bit of like Googling on the culture here. Right. Because all of those rights that you just talked about are not rights in Gaza. They are not. And it's strange to me that you have so many kids and again i think whether or not it's the iranians or the russians or the chinese or whoever it is pumping all this mis and disinformation into social media channels like these are like the average you know hamas leader doesn't want you alive any more than they want the israeli alive oh yeah we're we're really seeing that horseshoe theory of politics you know it, it, where um, you know, the, the crazies on the left and the crazies on the right have, have sort of more in common than, than you'd think. Um, look, I'm, I'm all for free speech, right? Like people can say what they want and college kids, if there are any college kids listening, your brain is not fully developed yet. And you know, what you think, what you think, you know, is, is going to change over time. Um, that being said, you know, it, it's tough. Are they literally connected, right? Like we're at a moment in, in world history where autocracy is on the march. It's on the march in Russia. It's on the march in China. It's on the, it's on the march in the Middle East. And it's on the march, you know, most pressingly here at home. And, you know, we've got now, and, and these are connected. And whether they're connected, you know, explicitly, you know, there probably was no Tehran conference where Donald Trump and Putin and you know, whomever got together and said, hey, this is what we're doing. Right. No, they I'm just told that... him. They just told him what to do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, you know, but they're they're connected. They're connected because the world is sort of new and changing and has, you know, it's things are scary and confusing. And in times like that, people turn to people who claim to have the answers. So, you know, people like Trump, who, you know, is completely full of shit and has the answer to nothing, you know, it's from everything from running a business to running a country. He doesn't know how to do it, but he can convince enough people that he can. And these are all this is a really, really dangerous time in global history. Um, I think we win. I, I think we have the better argument. I think we have the better hand, but it's going to take some doing. And, you know, if we sit back and do nothing, then we're, we're going to be very and our children are going to be living with the results for for a long time. Well, and, you know, I was doing a, I was doing a uh, an Instagram live with an allied group of ours earlier. And they said, what's what's the thing that worries you most? And I said, again, you know, being history nerds, Dan, 
how does this stuff go down when too many when enough people just say it doesn't matter anyway? Yeah, screw it. Right. My vote doesn't matter. My voice doesn't matter. Apathy, apathy of the good people and antipathy of the bad people. Like that's what gets us in most trouble. Yep. I mean, you know, you know, someone like Biden, right? You know, you hear it. Well, I don't know how much of a tangent you want to go on Democrats, but, you know, go. so <laughs> go ahead. You know, you've, got, you've got a primary challenger to Joe Biden right now. Right. And, you know, the. Joe Biden getting primaried by, uh, what is he, a, a three-term congressman, you know, from his own party is insane. It's insane on a number of levels, but it's, it's such a Democrat thing to do. And I consider myself a Democrat now, but like, good God, people, like, you know what, there's a, um, um, it, we're, we're doing Republican talking points for them, you know, at this point, right? Like, we're, we're saying that Joe Biden's old. Yeah, of course he's old. He's not old. He's wise, right? He's done this shit for a long time. He knows what he's doing. Okay. You know, there's a way in which to frame these things that the Democrats are just not doing. Like, you know, we're playing right into, you know, kind of Donald Trump's hands every time we, we say something. I mean, J Joe Biden is going to be the Democratic nominee. It's 100%. There is no doubt. And this defeatism is just such a uniquely kind of Democrat thing. Um, you know, it's 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 like, guys, we just got to fight on our hands, man. Just bite down on your mouth guard and throw like let's 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 get moving, you know. And so um, it can be very frustrating uh, to see the way in, in which the the party that controls the Senate and the presidency in, you know, an economy with the, the lowest joblessness rate ever or, or at least in the last 30 years. Um, that is kicking ass and taking names internationally are sort of like, oh, well, let's primary our own guy. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that per you know, it's interesting um, because y you talk about a primary um, to the president and this individual, um, Dean Phillips is his name, um, on the day that he announced his, pres you know, his, his run, and again, I put that in air quotes, he was asked about what he would do in Gaza, and he said, well, I have an opinion when it's over. And the reporter's like, what kind of leadership is that, right? Um, and, you know, this is the kind of thing where, you know, you see the contrast between whether or not it's this guy from Minnesota or a Donald Trump, which is in these kinds of things, Dan, experience matters, right? Like knowing what you're doing most of the time is better than not knowing what you're doing. But when you are handling... As president of the United States, not only the most effective and efficient military the world has ever known, but also the, big, the, the biggest economy the world has ever known. The most power in one contiguous area that any human humanity could have ever imagined, right? And most of it really coming in the last 70 or so years, right? Um, you, there's no, like, we see what happens. You get Donald Trump, Right. Like he didn't know his ass from a hole in the ground. And not only that, he didn't want to know more. <laughs> right? He didn't care. He thought, it, he thought it was all a big joke anyway. He thought none of it mattered, but it does matter. And, and so I, I think to myself, like, when you're a Dean Phillips or an RFK Jr. or a Cornell West, like, you're jokers, right? You have no idea. Like, if, if Bobby Kennedy Jr.'s name was Bobby Smith Jr., nobody would care, right? Nobody would give a shit. Yeah. Biden, you know, I don't care how many burpees Joe Biden can do. I want him to keep us out of a war in the Middle East, minimize casualties, keep the economy on track, which he is doing. And Democrats are like, mm, right? Like, guys, it's not time to panic. It's time to, like, get on your horse and start throwing punches. You know, it's, it's interesting. Somebody said, um, what did somebody say? Uh, I was, somebody said today, it's like, you know, um, Republicans are like an orchestra. They all play the same tune at the same time. And Democrats are like a music festival. It's like one different act after another. And I thought that was a brilliant uh, analogy because it really is true is that, as I have said, and the listeners have probably heard too many times, the strength of the, the big D Democratic coalition is its, its diversity, but that's also its weakness, which is, yes, there's plenty of overlapping areas, but also when you find those strike points like we're finding now, um, you know, um, it can be very it can be damaging politically. And because, you know, I, I've, I've you know, I've now spent almost four years working with 
Democrats, Dan. And the one thing I can say is that very few of them are willing to like look at the people who are acting badly and say it's enough already. It's time, you know, you've you all right. You said what you needed to say. Are you done? Because you should be done now, right? Like we're not fooling around here anymore. And and um, you know, it's just a different way of looking at it, right? On Republican campaigns, it's like, okay, who believes Hamas is good? Raise your hands. Okay, you're done. Please collect your things and move, <laughs> and we'll see you later, right? Never would happen on a Democratic campaign. They couldn't even imagine it. Um, that probably makes them better people in some regards, but it also makes them more open to the sort of, again, I'll use that foxtail analogy of getting stuck with that thing and being unwilling or unable to know what to do about it, and then it festers. All right, let us let's let me switch gears on you, Dan. Let's talk medicine. You're an you're an ER doctor. Um, what are you seeing in Vermont, um, a state that is small, but I think representative of of a lot of things? Um, what are you seeing, you know, in the real world, as I call it? What's coming through your doors that's worrying you? The ER is a cyclical place, right? So in the summertime, you get your traumas, you get the drunk kids jumping off the, you know, the rocks. And in the wintertime, you get your respiratory stuff. And so, you know, I, I will say that through vaccination or enough people have gotten it that COVID is, if not in the rear view, at least it's, you know, kind of at a steady state. And, and there's there's good evidence showing that COVID is um, is less virulent, uh, you know, than it was at its peak. Um, Vermont in particular, um, you know, we struggle with uh, we struggle with drugs. We struggle with, you know, mental health crises. Uh, some of that is downstream trickle effects from COVID. Um, you know, the fentanyl, the xylazine um, combo, the fentanyl xylazine combo, I think we're uh, well past our record for overdose deaths and, and overdoses just in general. Um, the Vermont has an aging population, which and it's not unique. And what's what's interesting about geriatric medicine is it, it really kind of cuts across, you know, red and blue. Um, you know, the oldest state is Maine. I think Vermont's number two and then Florida's number three. Uh, you know, so they're really as the American population ages, things get much, um, you know, the problems of, of the elderly, right, become become more apparent. Um, you get more falls, you get more, you know, broken hips and, and things like that. But, um, you know, the thing we struggle with the most is is really finding a way to manage the mental health crisis and, you know, finding enough beds for folks with mental health issues. And that combined with methamphetamine and fentanyl and xylazine is, is, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty tough thing to manage. So those are the big things that we struggle with up here. Those are crises in, in, in Vermont, but also across the country. Do you, is there anything knowing that you're not a psychiatrist? Um, is there anything you can ascribe the mental health crisis to is it something that we've always struggled with is there was it covid was it the overall just stress of the world what do you think has driven this i mean i just like you and i are pro up of approximate age right i'm sure there were people with we probably had a major mental health health crisis in the 70s and 80s as well but it just you know it either wasn't talked about or certainly it was it was taboo, right, for someone in your family to to be suffering from this. Um, it's a sickness, but it's not like cancer. Right. It's it's a different thing. Um, and when I say it's not like cancer, what is you go, you get treated and, you know, hope to God you're better. Right. It's a different kind of treatment regimen that really might go on forever. Um, but what do you if you had to give us a couple of ideas on what's driving so much of this mental health crisis, what do you think it might be? Yeah, and that's a great question. So, I mean, there's a couple issues. So, there's an increased number of folks who don't have access to treatment. And, you know, we used to put people, and I'm, believe me, I'm not saying this was better. Um, we used to put people in asylum, right? You know, there used to be state mental health hospitals. Vermont had a state mental health hospital. And when we went away from that model and sort of treating a lot of these things outpatient, um, we we realize that, you know, there are certain things which you need inpatient beds for. What we struggle with, and this is not unique to Vermont, I suspect this is national, is that we, when COVID happened, we lost a lot of our beds downstream and then it just trickled down, right? So, you know, you clo if you close a nursing home because of COVID, 
and that nursing home doesn't exist anymore, you know, those folks who should be in the nursing home, well, they stay in the hospital. You know, there are people inpatient in the hospital for months who should be, you know, they don't have an acute medical need. Maybe they have an acute nursing need or like a physical therapy, but they, they're just not safe to go home. And there's no nursing home to send them to. So, you know, that trickles down to the ED. And then in the ED, we've got patients who are, you know, kind of hanging out. And, and all of this is true on the mental health side as well. Um, I think when you combine that with drugs with sort of known um, psychoactive properties like, like meth, um, you know, and, and fentanyl and, and the drugs of abuse that we see now, um, it really is kind of a perfect storm. Um, you know, up here in Vermont, we had, uh, you know, money from the federal government for, for putting folks, getting folks off the street and, you know, not having these homeless shelters where everyone's just, you know, on a cot in a gymnasium. And we, we had money to put them in, in folks in motels and hotels and things like this. And that money is now gone. Right. So all those people are back on the street. And that is, uh, you know, a big change um, from what it was, what it was prior. Uh, so mental health, I couldn't give you numbers. I should, I should know this, but anecdotally, I'll tell you that mental health and the downstream mental health effects are the absolute biggest problem that, you know, is kind of driving, uh, you know, this crisis. Um. All right. Before I let you go, and and thank you for switching gears on me there. I want to I want to come back to something that that you've been working on, uh, which is uh, the Veterans for Responsible Leadership. So tell us a little bit about the group and what you are are hoping to do here in the next twelve months or so. Absolutely, I'd love to tell you about that. So so VFRL, um, you know, some of you listeners may know us. Uh, if you don't, please check us out at, at VFRL dot org. Um, we are a group of veterans uh, who have as one mission uh, the pr preservation of small d democracy. That is our only issue. Um, we like folks who, practically speaking, are you know big D Democrats in this election because they're the ones who care about small d democracy. Um, we also liked you know Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger when they were in the House, but e there aren't any R's on the on the side of small d democracy right now. Um, we're getting ready, Reed, as I'm sure you are. Um, I think things are going to become real scary real quick uh, in January when Donald Trump starts winning Iowa and wins New Hampshire. And we're working on a plan to be ready to go as we move through this, as we move through this electoral season, things are going to get scarier and scarier. Donald Trump is going to get more and more desperate as his legal crises grow. Um, and he's going to keep winning primaries. Nobody's going to knock him off. Nikki Haley is not going to beat Donald Trump at South Carolina, and that's her home state, okay? This is a done deal, folks. And so come on board, help us. We're looking for volunteers. We've got some great new volunteers. Uh, we're always looking for a way to explicitly make the argument, our niche in this, our lane in this, is to explicitly make the argument that Donald Trump is unfit to be the commander-in-chief of the United States military. That's what we're saying. That's what we're sticking to. Um, and starting in January, it's it's go time. Well, that's all great. And so go to VFRL.org. And Dan, before we let you go, where can we find you, if you dare, on social media or where else can we find you? So check us out at vets for rl uh, on X and uh, we'll be up and running soon. You can find our podcast, the VFRL podcast on the Resolute Square website and uh, stand by because there's more coming. Well, amen to that. As always, gang, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Reed Galen, on threads and Instagram at Reed underscore Galen underscore LP, and on Substack, the home front. Please find it, read it, sign up for it. Dan Barkoff, thank you not only for all of your service in the past, for what you're doing for your community now, and for what you and your group will do in the next year. Thanks, Reed. Pleasure to be here. All right. And everybody else, we'll see you next time. Thanks again to everyone for listening. Be sure to follow and subscribe to The Lincoln Project on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or however you listen. Don't forget to leave a five-star review. To connect with us, follow us on Twitter, at Project Lincoln. And for more information on our movement, to join our mailing list, subscribe to our newsletter, or make a contribution to our efforts, visit lincolnproject.us. If you want to message the podcast directly, please send an email to podcast at lincolnproject.us. 
And if you want to personally join the fight to save our nation's democracy, visit jointheunion.us. For The Lincoln Project, I'm Reed Galen. I'll see you on the next episode. Thank you.